So welcome back to Half Past Capitalism, where we talk about alternatives to capitalism as if they were possible. This show is part of the Harbinger Media Network, and our guest today is Joe Guinan, who is the president at the Democracy Collaborative. Uh, he's also co-author of People Get Ready, Preparing for a Corbyn Government, and uh, The Case for Community Wealth Building. Welcome, Joe. Thanks very much for having me, Joe. Um, so I want to get to some of your other work in a little bit, but uh, but the reason I invited you on was because you wrote a very interesting paper a while back uh, about the Meidner plan. Um, and, and the Meidner plan was, as far as I can tell, a bold, very bold proposal to transfer ownership, uh, and, you know, not just redistributing income, but in, in redistributing ownership of Sweden's major industries to the workers directly. Um, so yeah, what was the Meidner plan? Can you talk a bit about it? Yeah, certainly. And it's fun to dig back into this. Um, the Meidner plan uh, was a proposal for wage earner funds in Sweden in the mid-1970s. And uh, to my mind, it's one of the most interesting and promising roads not taken by the European left in the second half of the 20th century. Looking back on it, if it actually had been implemented in full, which it wasn't, it would really have marked that major shift that you talked about within social democracy that would have moved us away from merely looking at redistributing income to the redistribution of assets and ownership of the economy. Uh, it was developed really as a radical response to the strategic problems that were facing the labor movement in Sweden at the time, uh, which was the trade-off between, on the one hand, full employment and price stability, and on the other, equality and efficiency. And they were really looking for a way to thread that needle in a way that would arrive at a more equitable distribution within Sweden of the gains um, from growth. But that quickly in the design of the plan took them into some very pr profound matters of political economy that were really about the di dilemmas of how to build and, and, and accelerate private capital formation, but combine that with democratic control over the process itself. And what the Meidner proposal would have done um, would have been steadily um, over time to transfer the ownership of enterprises to their workers, uh, which would combine goals of industrial democracy at the firm level with a broader exercise of collective control over investment in the economy um, as a whole. And the way that this was to happen was, to, was, was very clever. Um, it was designed to be a repeated share levy on all businesses above a certain size. The size was debated in different plans, 50 or 100 employees, depending on the version. Uh, but really, it would have encompassed, the, by and large, most of, uh, of the private sector of the Swedish economy. Uh, and, and that function is, is, is a capitalist function that's normally thought of the issuance of new shares, um, either as capital raising uh, by companies or as... Um, uh, benefits that are offered to executives. Um, when you issue new company stock, um, you water down the value of all uh, preceding company stock. And so um, what, what this was really doing was harnessing that mechanism um, and turning it to the benefit of workers who would be the only ones that would be entitled to these repeated share disbursements. Um, and then um, each time the stock was watered down and there was a right to new shares only by the workers and the wage earner fund, it would become a larger and larger um, owner um, of, of the company, ultimately getting to the point where it would be the majority owner. And when this was generalized across all of the Swedish economy, um, this would have been the tip over from uh, social democratic redistribution into democratic socialist ownership, um, which is why there was so much pushback. And, and the plan was that voting rights would be exercised within the company uh, by local worker representatives until the wage earner fund reached a certain share of the equity capital in that company. Um, the proposal was about 20%, at which point um, those shares would then, the subsequent shares would be transferred to regional boards that would then be um, uh, have appointees from the national trade unions, other social interests, nonprofits, um, the third sector, et cetera, and managed for wider public purposes. So there'd be a benefit not just to the workers in industry, but also to society as a whole. Um, and there was a particular rationale uh, for designing it in this way that was to do with um, the windfall excess profits um, at high performing companies that were becoming a real problem for the operation of the Swedish economy. But we'll get into that, I think, a little bit later. But again, this what this proposal would have done would have been shifted the focus of social democratic strategy from redistribution um, to, to one of taking control of the means of production, uh, which is a pretty classic definition of, uh, of socialism and, uh, and how to move beyond capitalism. 
Um, so assuming a share levy of about 20% of gross profits, Meidner calculated that if you had a firm making 10% profit per year, uh, worker owners, uh, they'd be majority owners within 35 years in a company. So a long range gradual plan, but a very radical one if looked at um, over the long haul. Eventually, the workers and wider social interests would have been masters of the Swedish economy within a matter of decades, um, which was, uh, as one observer commented, amounted to the abolition of private ownership and control by the capitalists. So a pretty radical proposal. So Yeah, it seems like it's it's a kind of a funny intersection between sort of tax policy, which just sounds so wonky, and then like basically what amounts to all power to the workers, which is, you know, as romantic as it gets. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm curious, like, I mean, it seems like the level of militancy that would be required to like advance such a plan. I mean, I mean, it, it, it goes against really what one thinks of as social democracy. The basic idea is that you keep the core of capitalism and, and private investment as the engine of the economy. Uh, and then you sort of build things on top of that. You build a social safety net, you build social programs, public services, and you take certain things, you have a mixed economy, basically. You, you take things, some, certain things out of the, um, out of the private sector and you, um, and you keep, keep, keep the sort of big building blocks, uh, of industry in the, in the, in the private sector. Um, but this isn't that this is, this is wholesale transfer of all the major industries, um, so, yeah, so I guess I guess could you just comment on that, and then I want to get into the sort of um, yeah the level of militancy required I think to to, to advance such a proposal. Yeah, I think um, I mean it, it's pretty interesting that this proposal emerged from the trade union federation, the LO, um, which you know was operating well within the confines of a social democratic system. In fact, there were. Um, well-established principles of social peace and social partnership, um, uh, a tripartite bargaining model between government, um, uh, private capital owners, and the labor unions. Um, and yet there were problems with that model and system as it, as it unfolded that forced them into trying to come up with fixes to those problems that then pushed them in some ways up against uh, the limits of social democracy, which is actually the name of an interesting book by Jonas Pontesson that discusses the um, the, the wage earner funds in Sweden. Um, and, and so there's something about the context, I think, that's particularly relevant to the moment that we're in today. Um, it did require a great de deal of worker militancy. Um, when the plan was actually adopted, it was adopted unanimously at the, the um, uh, Quinquennial uh, LO uh, conference in 1976. And when the vote was passed, there was a standing ovation and a rendition of the Internationale. So the, the trade unionists knew that they were engaged in doing something very radical. But the reason that they felt it necessary to do so was the backdrop, um, which was one of the beginnings of, of crisis and a wider breakdown of that decades long historic political economic settlement in Sweden. Um, and so they basically had to come up with a solution to the, the problems um, facing the social democratic model and its breakdown that, that took them far beyond um, the, the social democratic model itself. And this was true, not just of the, the Meidner plan in Sweden, but of other proposals that were generalized across Europe and North America at the time by the left. Uh, we saw the alternative economic strategy, for example, of the British Labour Party, um, which um, also similarly took on investment politics and a kind of anti-capitalist position um, on economic development. Um, and there were many other instances where people were turning in a similar direction. So there was this context, if you like, of increased worker militancy, there was, but there were problems with the model as well, the social democratic model, the beginnings of capital flight and investment slump, things that were under, undermining the viability of what had been you know, the, the 30 glorious years of post-war social democracy that followed the war, um, which was a unique period, um, sadly, probably not to be repeated in, in some ways, but one that temporarily allowed both labor and capital to enjoy um, enjoy the fruits of growth. Uh, but when that growth started to falter, that was the point at which um, there needed to be a resolution one way or the other. And, this, and the Meidner proposal, therefore, was... Um, was a, a, a an attempt to resolve that crisis of the 1970s in favor of 
of labor and of broader social forces rather than what actually happened, which was that it got resolved in favor of capital. And we've had um, four decades of neoliberalism, inequality, rampant climate change and, and everything else ever since. So if, if you look at the specifics of, uh, of how the Meidner plan emerged, it was in it was in response to what's being called the trilemma of social democracy in Sweden, which was the difficulty of reconciling full employment on the one hand, which is the goal of any social democratic um, operation uh, worth its salt, and making sure that there are, um, are, are paid jobs for everybody that wants them um, and that nobody is suffering from the scourge of unemployment. On the other hand, wage solidarity, which is something that was particular to Swedish social uh, democracy, although appears elsewhere as well, uh, which was a, a sense that people should be paid um, fair wages for, for the same work, the same wages for the same work. And so an attempt to equalize um, wages. And so you saw this through Sweden's particular model of collective bargaining, very high levels of trade union membership in the um, 80s uh, in terms of percentiles. Um, and um, and with that system was a system of sectoral bargaining, of national bargaining, and the unions went into um, into those negotiations over wages with this commitment to wage solidarity, right, which was about shrinking the differential um, between the lowest paid workers and median and higher paid workers by lowering um, the wage agreements for those at the top and raising them for those at the bottom. And it was actually very successful um, as a policy. It shrunk um, differentials very significantly over the decades in which it was practiced. But um, what you then got was um, was uh, a problem then of high corporate profits in certain companies. This was the problem of excess profits. And frankly, we're seeing a, a problem of excess profits again um, today, although for very different reasons and different circumstances. But again, makes it interesting to look back at this um, uh, at this model. So the way in which that worked was as follows, right? If you zoom out to where Sweden was in the post-war period, it had been neutral uh, during the war. Um, there'd been a very successful um, experience with uh, economic planning when neutral Sweden was basically surrounded by Nazi armies and um, trade had shrunk during the Second World War. And uh, so there was a very much uh, a need to to plan the national economy in the same way that happened in in other countries, belligerent or otherwise. Uh, but towards the end um, of the war, um, the plans had been for really extending uh, economic planning uh, in a socialist direction in the post-war period. But what Sweden experienced instead was a boom. Um, and as a result of that boom, the the decision was taken politically to move in the direction of a, a social democratic redistribution of the benefits of that growth uh, in partnership with business rather than in class confrontation. And so you had uh, these agreements um, on the parts of all the, the so-called social partners. Uh, business was at the table for bargaining. Um, you then didn't get large-scale nationalization or socialization of industry in Sweden. In fact, despite it being one of the most equal countries in the world, it had a very high concentration of ownership of private enterprise in the hands of literally a handful of, uh, of very well-known uh, industrialist families. Um, and with that context, basically a, a commitment by the unions uh, not to weaken the competitiveness of Swedish industry internationally, because they were, had an export orientation for their growth. Um, and as a result, uh, a need to, um, to also look to uh, essentially eliminating laggard companies, companies that weren't as competitive, companies that were, were falling behind. So they didn't want a, a sort of propping up the lemons approach because the overall model depended on competitiveness uh, internationally and growth. It then required redistribution within that, so very high levels of social spending. Um, but also the fear of inflation um, meant that there had to be some control over the rate of wage increases. Um, otherwise, inflation would begin to undermine the whole model. And what the, what the problem there was is that as more and more companies either got more competitive or went to the wall and failed, 
Swedish policy was also, uh, given the social democratic nature of the state, not to let people suffer from unemployment. There had to be active labor market measures to find them new employment. And so there were very targeted, very high levels of intervention to put people into new jobs in more competitive companies. Um, But then there was this peculiarity, which was that as as you ran that system over time, what you got was the wages rising um, for the lower paid, but being held down um, for the higher paid compared to the profitability of their companies. So in the very competitive, profitable uh, sector, there were, if you like, there were unrealized wage claims by uh, by intention by the trade unions because they wanted wage solidarity. And the problem that you got there is that uh, is the excess profits threatened to do a number of things. One, um, they threatened to undermine the overall model through increased inequality at the top, which wasn't seen as as acceptable and wasn't part of, of the vision for where Sweden was trying to go. It also threatened to undermine the position of the trade unions on bargaining, where it was to be done sectorally and nationally, because you, there was a risk of wildcat strikes when workers saw that um, the company was raking it in, but they um, were not realizing the benefits of their increased productivity. The danger there was either runaway strikes and wage claims outside of that system, uh, which would then begin to accelerate wage inflation and get the, the whole system moving in that direction and then undermine it from within. So the the particularities of what Meidner designed was a way to intervene in um, the operations of the social democratic um, agreement that was in place, broadly speaking, with this technical fix for what to do about excess profits. Because at the same time, uh, he didn't want to intervene with a tax. He didn't want to intervene with anything that would disincentivize productivity and competitiveness, because the whole model depended on the success of Sweden's capitalist enterprises. Um, and and so um, he didn't want to take investment out of successful companies, which um, uh, something like an additional tax or, uh, or, or some other levy um, would have done. So he had to find a way to transfer those benefits to to initially the workers, but also the broader society without intervening in a way that impacted the operations of the company. And that's what the share levy did. It very, it, the, the money stayed in the firm. It's just that who was the beneficial owner was changing over time. And then there would be dividends in the same way that there were dividends to existing shareholders. But increasingly, those dividends would be going to the workers and then beyond that to these regional funds that could then reinvest them. But wouldn't when you transfer ownership to the workers, I mean, yeah, you can keep you in theory, you could just keep running it as a capitalist enterprise and have all the same priorities of profit and everything else. But in in practice, wouldn't you end up transforming the whole paradigm? And and I mean, Meidner must have known that he was basically departing, at least in, in terms of the power structures from social democracy into some kind of proto-communism effectively because the workers then control their their industry and so then if they want to work a 20-hour work week like they can phase that in (laughs) if they want to um you know sacrifice productivity uh for quality of work life or workplace democracy they can do that if they want to uh you know yeah i mean they can do anything they, they can do lots of they can make lots of choices at that point that don't involve um, prioritizing profits, which is obviously the engine of the whole thing. Um, so did he anticipate that or did the, the planners of the minor plan sort of anticipate that? Um, and, and, and how did they think about it? Yeah, so just in terms of of how it came about, um, Meidner himself had been the the chief economist of the LO, uh, the labor organization for a while, um, and then was given a mandate to set up a Um, a working party back in 1973. So he added um, a couple of other leading um, trade unionist economists um, to to his team to develop a proposal which was given uh, the task of solving for three objectives. First was to maintain what I was talking about before, which was the wage policy based on the principle of solidarity. The second was to counteract the concentration of wealth at the top. Um, which was coming from the existing system and through industrial self-financing. And then the third um, was to increase the influence which employees have over the economic process. And that last objective was very surprising, right? Because in in and of itself, 
it struck at the heart of the social democratic compromise in Sweden um, by essentially um, giving a mandate to look at how to increase worker ownership and control. Um, and, um, and, and, and so this was a, an interesting proposal because it was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it was a very technical fix that had very um, uh, carefully thought through um, rationales and reasons for being put into effect to intervene in what was widely recognized as, as an anomalous problem of the, um, of the social democratic model. On the other, it had this hugely explosive um, uh, potential economic impact and political impact, right, which uh, really got at the heart of, of how uh, decisions are made um, in capitalism and transferred and in some way socialized that, that decision making process. There's, um, there's a nice quote from Adam Przorski, who who says the following investment decisions, decisions to withhold a part of society's resources from current consumption and to allocate them to replace or augment the instruments of production have an impact that is both general and long lasting, that is public. Yet the very institution of private property implies that they are a private prerogative. Control over investment is the central political issue under capitalism, precisely because no other privately made decisions have such a profound public impact. So what you're saying is exactly right. And in fact, we saw this um, in um, in the consultation exercise and in some of the plans that were being made for um, how the Meidner plan would actually have been implemented in, in practice. There was, for example, a lot of interest on the part of, um, of workers in seeing the dividends that would start to flow initially to the company level wage earner funds and then to the regional level um, be used to accomplish a number of, of objectives that were very foreign to um, the the existing owners of capital. One of them, um, which I think has, is an interesting thing for the left to digest, that came up a lot in the surveys that were done, was a, a serious appetite to develop financial literacy on the part of workers so that they could make better decisions in the management of their own company, I think which is a, a really significant um, argument uh, in terms of uh, the interest and appetite for economic democracy and how that would actually um, look in 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 practice. The other thing that that you mentioned that I think was um, was definitely a potential outcome had the Magna plan been implemented in full is that you would have essentially found these wage earner funds operating as um, as democratic, decentralized economic planning bodies that were were able to then um, use the returns um, to. Uh, to the funds to invest um, in other uh, socially um, useful production and uh, and also to augment the amenities and uh, and and shape the future of communities and regions and the economy um, and then at that point you 're really moving away from uh, from basically operating a technical scheme within capitalism to operating a form of democratic control over investment and economic planning which begins to look an awful lot like decentralized worker and community-led economic planning for the benefit of society as a whole. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I mean, I think I'm sort of repeating myself now, but it, it really is striking how, you know, I feel like, re, you know, revol economic revolutions or political revolutions often come from these like places of passion where it's like, we'll, we'll figure out the problems later. We really need, just need to take power. But this one really, it seems to have really come from obviously a high level of worker militancy, but combined with this like sort of pouring over the like technical economic problems and, and sort of realizing things are going to get either worse for workers or, or, or better depending on the amount of control they have. Um, and it's really, yeah, I, I just want to sort of highlight the, what you were saying before about the sort of, t t the sort of tipping point where you're like, you're sort of in the as the sort of social democratic planning based economy with a bunch of a small number of families who own a bunch of the industry you're in this situation where you're sort of tilting between like you're you're in the middle of the contradictions of capital and like social good basically <laughs> and so and so when there's a crisis you're sort of tilting it one way or the other and and obviously Meidner was trying to to tilt it the other way um yeah, I, I guess I wanted to come back to um, the question of, of of that transition. I mean, it seems like if you did carry out this transition, 
you would have sort of two problems. One is that capital doesn't want to give up control. And so you're going to, you're going to put yourself in a situation where you could have some kind of fascist coup backed by these families, presumably, or, you know, implicitly, um, or you could end up with, yeah, like basically it's just not acceptable to, to take to capital to end to the capital owning class to like, take that away to take away control of the economy so that would be one problem and and that, and that seems to be an issue with the sort of gradualism of the proposal is like yeah it is it is certainly more rational to have a revolution that hands over control of the workers over like a you know 20 year period cuz then you can work out the kinks of the system and you get a, a chance to sort of you know it it makes sense on a certain level but it doesn't make sense in the sense that you're capital is not going to put up with that. And and that's going to give them a, a lot of time to like find a way to undermine it. Um, and I guess the other, the more practical question is, even if you got past that, wouldn't you end up with a, like not like a diminishment of international competitiveness, competitiveness, I guess the workers would have to self-discipline in accordance with the international market to the extent that they're participating in it. Um, and I, and then, but then wouldn't you also have a situation where you have capital flight uh, on, a, on a sort of mass scale? So you basically give up the ability to have international investment or certainly, uh, I would imagine, a significant reduction in international capital fueling your economy. Um, yeah, that's, that's like several sort of challenges. But, but yeah, I guess I was hoping you could, you could address some of those. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll take the second first um, because it's more theoretical and then we can turn to what actually happened in terms of how capital reacted to the Magna plan because we've got history to learn from in that regard. So I think the the there's always going to be that that question of, of rupture um, from global markets, from international competitiveness, if you're in the process of trying to develop um uh, anything that begins to go beyond the acceptable limits of maybe a social democratic settlement at the outside, but um, but but essentially, isn't there a counter to that, which is to say, if you look at where a lot of investment in Swedish um, uh, industry was coming from and had come from, um, first of all, um, if you do maintain international competitiveness and in practice that self-discipline then you're able to do self-financing which was the the mechanism by which the most competitive companies had been growing anyway and that was the the, pr the very process that Meidner and his plan were attempting to to socialize it's also worth saying if you look at the great success stories um of um of sort of swedish industry um whether it's um uh the tetra pak company or ikea or whatever um, these are seen as uh, titans of, of international capitalist practice and competitiveness. But if you look at their origins, in many ways, their origins were in, um, were in public investment, right? So IKEA really got started because there were a million public sector houses that were built and had to be furnished um, by the Swedish state. And, um, and so that was where um, demand and, and, uh, and the growth of, of that company came from. Tetra Pak similarly um, related to innovation that had to occur as part of managing agriculture and dairy production and, and so on. And so I suppose, I suppose there, there's, there was always the danger of, uh, of capital flight and of um, of investment drying up from overseas, but um, but as long as you um, continue to discipline yourself to be pursuing efficiency um, in what you are um, what you're enacting in these companies, then there's no reason why you wouldn't have been able to continue um, investment. And in fact, we have um, also the example of what did get implemented in the end um, in terms of the way journal funds, and maybe we'll just come to that at the end. But to turn. Um, then to your other point, which is domestic resistance. Um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So just to go back to the history for a moment. So the Meidner plan um, that Meidner and his team had been given this set of problems to 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 design a, an elegant solution to in, in 73. You've gone away and done that, come back um, and presented their solution 
um, to the LO Congress in 76. It was, it was a standing um, ovation from all the workers, a rendition of the Internationale, and then the shit hit the fan, right? Not to put too fine a point on it. First of all, the Social Democrats who had been governing Sweden for most of the, uh, the post-war period went ballistic. Ola Palme uh, was furious at the LO um, and had a shouting match with, um, with the chair of the LO, Gunnar Nilsson, um, accusing him of springing the proposal on the party, of blindsiding them. Um, and Swedish business owners, of course, were even less impressed. Um, they, you know, they didn't particularly uh, give much credence to the very careful work that had been done to build positive aspects for them into, um, into the plan, such as um, increased capital formation for productive investment that would have occurred and instead saw this as what it was, which was an attack on the prerogatives of private capital ownership. And so they mobilized very energetically against this. And so the SAP actually went on to lose the 1976 election, uh, which saw the first non-socialist, um, non-social democratic government in Sweden uh, since 1932. So having been put on the table at a moment of crisis um, as a solution, and then essentially had um, half of the, the, the political wing of the labor movement attack it and try to distance themselves from it, and then go down in defeat nevertheless, not least because... Um, of the mobilization of business leaders who spent something like three or four times the, the the total spent by all the political parties to beat this plan, which shows you how much they were were against it. Five times more, actually, um, now that I, I look at notes. Um, we even saw um, ABBA, the pop supergroup, um, issuing leaflets and uh, threatening to leave the country and, and offering to do um, free concerts to persuade young people to vote against um, against the plan and against its inaction. Um, and then what happened was that the, the proposal continued to be debated and banded back and forth in opposition. And then by the time that um, the, the Social Democrats in Sweden came back into government in the, um, in the 80s, things had changed dramatically, right, internationally. Um, that kind of red wave of worker militancy and the push for workers' control around the world had crested, and instead we got 1979 and 1980, the election of Thatcher and Reagan, um, and then the beginnings of um, of the sort of shock of uh, of neoliberalism um, and what that then did to um, to the social democratic model, which included very widespread job losses. Uh, it also saw uh, business basically taking the option uh, to opt out of the Swedish model as it had previously been practiced, and so the collapse of um, of, of that sort of social peace um, relationship between Swedish industry and the trade unions. Um, and uh, and the Magna plan sort of bobbed along in various forms um, all along, um, uh, alongside all of these changes. But what happened was that by the time the Social Democrats got back into government, it had been through a number of different variations, which basically watered down all aspects of it um, beyond recognition. So the wage earner funds... Um, when they were implemented, were only to cover companies that would have more than 500 employees, which is only about 200 companies in total. And they would only last for a very short period of time, a, a number of years. The profit sharing aspect, which had been so central as the dynamic of, of accumulation, was completely scaled back and the share levy mechanism abandoned. Um, which moved the proposal um, in a very different direction. There were going to be cash payments made to the funds that were financed by a tax on wages and profits. So workers would be contributing from their wages rather than just to, um, uh, building up um, these funds um, through the, the tax on profits. And the revenues were going to be divided up in a different way in a multiple fund system. They also had caps, which meant that they were only um, able to reach a certain share of ownership um, of publicly traded companies. So all the threat was kind of taken away, and this was repurposed in some ways into a forced saving scheme to boost um, investment and essentially had a passive ownership role um, for the funds themselves. Um, there were some loopholes, so the funds were permitted to invest in stock of both listed and unlisted companies, as well as in co-ops and other forms, um, and all of this was restricted to Swedish companies, and they were required to diversify their investments over the long term um, and deliver at least a 3% annual rate of, of return. 
um, with these limits on controlling no more than 8% of the voting stock of a, a single enterprise. But what they were able to do by investing in companies that were unlisted, they're able to get around some of these problems. Um, they also were able to coordinate so the funds could um, get towards that 8% cap, um, but do it in, a, in, in parallel with other uh, funds so that their collective weight um, was was pretty significant, and what you ended up with um, was um, was actually uh, a much less um, socially and politically interesting experiment, but economically a rather successful one. Um, in the a lot of the things that have been urged against the funds um, did not transpire. It was thought that they were going to be used um, to uh, subsidize inefficient production that returns and efficiency would suffer um, in response. Uh, there was even so much resistance, even against these watered down versions of the funds that business uh, people refused completely to participate in the governance of them. So um, the social democratic government was forced to staff the boards of these funds with um, with civil servants, with nonprofit leaders, people from um, religious community, as well as um, trade union representatives and so on. But there was this extraordinary... Um, class consciousness and class solidarity on the part of capitalists in boycotting even this version um, of the wage earner funds. But what you ended up with was um, was a pretty nice rate of return uh, in a way that allowed for some regional diversification of Sweden, some industrial planning, um, and the proceeds um, when actually another conservative government came in at a later date and liquidated the funds uh, were actually used to... Um, to, to fund some scientific research institutes that then were behind some of Sweden's technological breakthroughs around things like the Nokia phone um, and, and so on. So, in fact, the experience of the wage earner funds in practice, even though they were a lot less radical and significant than they would have been under the original proposals, disproved a lot of the objections that were made, showed that you can manage capital collectively um, through different mechanisms without compromising efficiency or returns um, and um, and kind of kept alive, uh, if you like, um, the idea for another day. Um, and it did come back another day recently. Um, uh, and maybe this trans transfers us into some of the other questions that you wanted to talk about. But um, the, there was a kind of little momentary afterlife for the Meidner plan uh, just a few years back um, under the Corbyn and McDonnell leadership of the British Labour Party. Um, there was a proposal developed in large part by Matthew Lawrence, a good friend of mine, who's the director of, of Commonwealth, um, together with others, for what was called um, inclusive ownership funds. Uh, and McDonnell, as shadow chancellor, basically had a, a policy that would have allowed for a, uh, a levy that would have, um, have basically given um, up to 10% of companies over into worker ownership, again, with a cap. And you need that cap for reasons of not increasing inequality between um, between workers in different companies, right? If you had if you were a worker at Apple and you had ten percent of the company, you'd be in a very different uh, position than if you were a worker in a ball bearings manufacturing company, for example. Um, so that was the reason for the cap and transfer system that was in um, in both uh, versions of uh, uh, of how to go about doing this, and then. Um, obviously, that didn't get enacted with the defeat of um, of Corbyn's Labour Party in 2019. But Bernie Sanders also took this up um, as part of um, the last presidential primary campaign in the United States. And Bernie's proposal was twice as radical as that of Corbyn and McDonald. He had um, what was a proposal for democratic ownership funds, um, again, along the same lines as the IOFs. Uh, but with um, with a ceiling that would have been twice as high. So 20% of all companies in the US would have, they, above a certain size, would have been transferred over time uh, into the ownership of, of their workers. And so I think there's something at, at the bottom of this particular design for economic um, democracy that causes people to keep coming back to it, particularly at moments of, of crisis, inequality, and excess profits, which was the case uh, at the time of the original Magna plan and is certainly the case again today. Um, I wanted to pick up on another point that you you brought up, which is the parallel between the rea the reaction of capital and the sort of ruling class to, you know, to the Meidner plan, but then also to Jeremy Corbyn, which has some, uh, as you pointed out, some, some, some parallels to be sure. Um, I, 
I guess if you if you could reflect on that briefly in the context of maybe thinking about what was missing in Meidner. I mean, the 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 <laughs> the wonky path to revolution seem see, like has a lot of really interesting lessons in it, but it doesn't seem like it's necessarily the it has doesn't have the juice that's going to carry us over the finish line. Uh, would be my sort of initial uh, thought, but um, but yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, having observed, obviously, a similar backlash happen in the UK. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so there were some severe limitations to trying to bring about democratic socialism through a small technical intervention, right? One of which was um, the sort of real benefits and ideological understanding of, uh, of them um, and the limitations thereof around a model that really looked at, in the first instance, socializing ownership um, for workers, adult workers, largely male, um, although not exclusively, um, and uh, and left out huge chunks of the electorate, right? The Those who don't work, those who are young, those who are old, those who, um, are, who have, have disabilities, those who are students, uh, those who work in the public sector where uh, wage earner funds obviously um, couldn't apply. And, um, and of course, that was a significant chunk of, um, of, of Sweden in terms of welfare capitalism. So, yeah, well, absolutely. Um, let alone your your outright class enemies. Um, so, um, I think the the balance of of immediate benefit and long run gain was off, um, and it's unfortunate, right? Because again, if we look at history and what actually happened, the Meidner Plan wasn't implemented in its full version. The social peace model that the Social Democrats were all upset with Meidner for having disrupted was going down the pan anyway. And as soon as they got the opportunity, Swedish capital dumped that model and engaged in large scale capital flight, disinvestment and social dumping. Uh, Sweden then saw the greatest increase in economic inequality of any country in the OECD in the, no, in the neoliberal period. Now, albeit starting from a, a much more equal baseline than, than most, but basically an unraveling of a lot of the gains that have been achieved um, for labor and associated social forces in, in the post-war period. And so I think we, you know, one of the things we we need to take away from that, and then similarly, I would argue also, um, and this was part of what I was urging in the book that I co-authored on, Corbyn, on, on Corbynomics and Corbynism called People Get Ready, Preparing for a Corbyn Government um, with Christine Berry, um, is, is getting really hard-nosed about about strategy and immediate benefits. One way of, of, of showing this is looking at what the neoliberals did, right? There were two main on-ramps for most of the population to neoliberalism. One was in a period in which actually your wages were likely to stagnate or fall behind in real terms. How do you create a wealth effect for those people? Well, you do it through housing um, and you do it through um, the big bang um, of uh, of deregulation of the city. So both through increased share ownership or through um, share ownership via private pensions, which is something that's also been pretty widely extended, and through the wealth effect of the capitalization of a lot of, of hot money into the housing market and land values, which have, and, and mortgage lending, which have really driven up house prices. You've had this wealth effect for you know, a, a strategic, significant enough portion of ordinary people in the UK, in the US, um, where even if wages were falling behind, um, there was a wealth effect that they were feeling through their ownership of assets. And so they were wired in, in some way to neoliberalism in that way. We um, on the left need to get much more astute about how to do upfront, direct and obvious economic benefits for people um, that aren't um, in the medium or long run, but are in the immediate, immediate term but not to get um, to take our eye off the ball in terms of the longer term um, non-reformist reforms and structural changes that we need to bring about in order to, to transform the system. And that's really tough to do, but there are some models. Um, one of the models that Christine and I pointed to in People Get Ready um, is the, um, the Ridley Plan, um, which was developed by Nicholas Ridley, a backbench Thatcherite conservative MP, um, when in opposition, uh, right before Thatcher won, Ridley had been um, a the scion of a coal mine owning family in the northeast who had seen coal mines nationalized by the 
post-war Labour government, and so his family uh, were diehard anti-socialists. He'd come into government with Ted Heath in 1970 with a commitment to reducing the, the share of the economy that was publicly owned, and Heath actually went into reverse and had to nationalise Rolls-Royce and a number of other interventions, which actually meant that a greater share of the economy was publicly owned after that Conservative government than, than at the beginning. And so Ridley was just not up for seeing them fail in that way again. And so came up with the report to, uh, to the Nationalised Industries Working Group, uh, which was then leaked and published briefly in um, in The Economist. So we had full warning of this, but it was a, a very clever plan for how to what was at that point known as denationalize or privatize um, the public sector, particularly um, those chunks of it that were um, most militant and the, the seen as the strongest opponents of what the conservatives were going to try to do to the economy. So they envisaged a future miner strike uh, and basically said, look, they've got us by the jugular vein. If we if the miners go on strike straight away, our government will collapse because we don't have stocks at the power stations. The, they have the rail unions to control the distribution, etc. So the plan laid out the things that needed to happen to prepare for a cold strike, including uh, arranging for power stations to be able to be fired by oil and, and coal. Um, so multiple ways, the development of a a, roll, a road haulage uh, fleet that was non-unionized that would be able to carry coal in the event that the, tra the, the trains, as they did, refused to, to transport coal during a strike, and also changes in the law um, around secondary picketing and a number of other things. They also laid out this sort of salami slicing approach to how to go about gradually introducing markets and and um, and sort of returns to capital measurements and so on in the public sector as a way to begin to soften up what, um, you know, those parts of the public sector that weren't immediately privatizable and particularly things like the National Health Service, where we saw a lot of market reforms introduced and a lot of managers given accountability. So we got to get as clever as, as they got in terms of how to roll out neoliberalism. If we're, so how, if we're how would you do that? How, how would you do that in reverse? Like give people dividends from... You know, well, dividend was, checks from like public companies or something, or I don't know. This was in part the theory of the inclusive ownership funds and of the the democratic ownership funds, which would have been immediate um, benefits to people um, from uh, from having those shares in their workplaces if they were private sector workers. But then you've got to flank that with other benefits for other sections of the population. In the UK, I think there would have been some real tangible benefits for people from the large scale renationalizations that were um, that were being proposed. But again, timing sometimes is everything. And, you know, if the things that uh, that today are being virtually universally supported in opinion polls, like taking water and railways and and so forth back in the energy companies back into public ownership, people have only realized the necessity of that because of the cost of living shocks and everything that people are going through at the moment with regard to inflation and greedflation and um, sellers inflation and the the and what's been happening to their their energy and food bills and, and so forth. So there's a different proposition now, but it was a few years too late um, for for Corbyn and McDonald, who, you know, basically were liquidated by the um, the British state media and um, and hung out to dry. Um, partly self-inflicted by the position that they took on Brexit, which was used as a the culture war issue to end all culture war issues to to smash them before they were able to to propose what I think today is even more necessary than than it was just a few years back.